modules we've discussed are just the first of six new guidelines which are going to be released. And as we heard earlier, these will include guidelines on the use of blood in medical procedures, obstetrics and paediatric care. And to tell us more, please welcome Dr Craig French. He's the co-chair of the College of Intensive Care Medicine of Australia and New Zealand and the Australian and New Zealand Intensive Care Society. Please welcome Dr French. One sort of are representing the changes that have occurred between this guideline and the clinical guidelines from 2001. The first sounds like a pretty sensible statement. Red cell transfusion should be dictated not by hemoglobin concentration alone, but based on the assessment of the clinical status. But unfortunately, really, practice has become, has become transfusing according to hemoglobin concentration alone. It didn't really matter what the patient looked like or how the patient felt. If the hemoglobin was 70 or 80, they got the blood transfusion. The next area that we were challenging is the single unit transfusion. And certainly over a decade ago, single unit transfusions were actively discouraged. If you're going to give a transfusion, you do two, three units, don't give a single unit. Completely now changing that focus, moving towards a single unit transfusion evaluating the effect of that transfusion on the individual patient and assessing whether further transfusion is appropriate. And that assessment takes not, not only into account a clinical assessment, but also a laboratory assessment as well. And finally, in patients with iron deficiency anemia, iron therapy is required to replenish iron stores regardless of whether a transfusion is indicated. 
again, the role of the uh, replacement of iron has undergone significant changes in the last decade. A lot of it being driven uh, by Captain Robinson and the team from South Australia as well, really in focusing the awareness of iron replacement and iron therapy in this broad population of patients. Clinicians, however, do want to have a number. They want to know at what hemoglobin should I be transfusing. Despite those sort of generic statements and saying you must apply to individual patients. So we have had to come up with some guidance across the broad range of medical patients, which assists clinicians in making that decision. Are the benefits of transfusion greater in this patient than the potential risks? In general, with a hemoglobin concentration of less than 70, red cell transfusion appears to be associated with reduced mortality and is likely to be appropriate. However, transfusion may not be required in well compensated patients, and there are certainly many patients with a hemoglobin, particularly in that 60 to 70 range, that may tolerate anemia relatively well, and other strategies to improve that hemoglobin concentration, such as the administration of erythropoietin and iron therapy, may be the benefit to them rather than transfusion. The grey zone is always this area of between 70 to 100 grams per litre. And in the previous guidelines, it basically was pretty much open slather. If you, if the patient had hemoglobin between 70 and 100, you could safely give a blood transfusion and no one would question your decision. Again, we're moving away from that again. We're saying, well, really, between 70 and 100, giving blood doesn't seem to actually So the decision to transfuse really needs to be based upon frequent reassessment of the patient, the patient's symptoms, the patient's clinical signs, how they've responded to previous transfusions as well. And importantly, when we looked at all the various subgroups, those patients who, if you top them up, they might be a bit better. The elderly patients who can suddenly, after a blood transfusion, get up and walk around. Well, the evidence from the research that we evaluated although not strong, simply doesn't support that view. And finally, the hemoglobin concentration of greater than 100, the old transfusion trigger from the sort of generator back in the 1940s when it was found that the viscosity of blood was often more that number, that's why the transfusion trigger was around 100. Unlikely to be a benefit, usually unnecessary, and importantly, in some groups of patients, may be associated with increased so give it a bit of a clinical context um, and how these may these guidelines may influence one particular area of practice. 52-year-old man, one of common scenario, comes in with a big myocardial infarct, gets reperfusion therapy, and his anemic on presentation is um, his hemoglobin presentation is 80. The resident is young and enlightened and has read the guidelines and asks the cardiologist who says he's demanding that give him blood, well, should we actually give him blood? And if so, how many bags of blood should we give? Um, the cardiologist then reevaluates his thinking and thinks of the potential benefits to the patient from blood transfusion, which actually have to be weighed against the potential of harm. And could the trick the anemia could well contribute to more myocardial damage, less hemoglobin, less oxygen delivery, critical myocardium, may be blood transfusion benefit. The anemia may increase his mortality, and these could be reduced by transfusion. However, could the transfusion in some way contribute to an adverse outcome, further blockages in arteries, thrombosis, all sorts of things? And is there any evidence to base any of these deliberations upon? Well, there, there is. I mean, there actually was quite a lot, probably of all the areas that we, we looked at in terms of hemoglobin concentration triggers the transfusion. The best data was in the setting of acute coronary syndromes. And certainly it would appear that we could come out and say that the hemoglobin concentration is less than 80 on the balance of probabilities for most patients, although so assess each patient individually, a red cell transfusion is a benefit to the patient. In that grey zone between 80 and 100 where patients are frequently transfused with acute coronary syndrome, the effect of red cell transfusion on patient outcomes is quite uncertain. And there could even still
still at that level be an increased risk of myocardial infarction. So any decision to transfuse when the hemoglobin is between 80 and 100 should be made with caution and based on careful consideration of the risks and benefits. And out of all this, we were actually able to make a recommendation, albeit at a, at a low level, but there was enough evidence from high quality research to support this statement that in acute coronary syndromes, patients with a hemoglobin of greater than 100, so these are patients that are still anemic by the WHO definition of anemia, red cell transfusion is not advisable because of an association with increased mortality. And this is certainly one way in which these guidelines will probably influence practice. So my area is actually in critical care medicine, extensive care, and the module for critical care is currently, or it's actually been reviewed by the MHMRC, and I think we got the feedback today. And in general, the feedback was pretty favourable, and I think we'll be able to move towards getting the guidelines endorsed quite quickly. So, so I'm pleased to say that the body of evidence for transfusion in the critical ill is substantially stronger than that of um, the broader medical population. Stage, still the grand, largest randomised controlled trial of transfusion practice in uh, the world has been done in the critical ill. And what will be the largest randomised controlled trial of transfusion in transfusion medicine is going to start randomising our first patients in October in Australia. And it's a, a study of looking at the age of blood and the effect on outcomes, and it's run by the NHMRC as well. So we were able to make some uh, recommendations related to transfusion practice in the critical ill. Unfortunately, for blood component therapy, there is a bad thing on us, the practice points there for plasma products to take in place. And the other area, and trans and acid control as well. And the second detention I see for it soon. The next modules that we've heard, the final phase, phase three, for those of us that have been in the long haul. Uh, it's due to commence next year, and hopefully we will uh, be a sort of a, probably a nine months time frame to get those guidelines written. Given our learnings over the past four years, and how we've improved the processes, I'll be a smiling <laughs> there, <laughs> we'll get them done in a, uh, in a uh, very timely fashion indeed. So I guess what these guidelines, what we hope to do is sort of challenge the dogma of medicine. Um, and I encourage, you know, traditionally, as I said, when I was going through medical school, we were just told these things by our superiors and we believed them because that was the case. And I hope I'll do this by little lemmings, not the 